Christian who is bored with their life or settling and compromising because they've stopped believing for something better. At Dad's house, you have the unfortunate fortune of having a pastor who refuses to settle for the mundane and the boring and the easy. I'm looking for adventure. And I, I'm going to be I'm going to be honest. It might make us all a little uncomfortable sometimes, but at the end of the day, I refuse to do life as usual, church as usual, and God as usual. Jesus saw a group of fishermen who were content to catch fish from one sea in one city in one country, and Jesus calls out to them. He says, "Stop what you're doing." And come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. I'll tell you how to catch the world. Amen. And they did. And that's the call of adventure. Jesus doesn't want to give you your piece of the pie. He wants to give you the entire bakery. And so this morning, I want us to understand that our call is to live like Jesus actually meant what he said when he calls us to take on the grandest of adventures. I believe that we were born for adventure. And this morning I want to wake you up to possibility. When Jesus says all things are possible, our response should not be, great, I'll settle for the easy ones. Our, res our response should be, what is possible? I think it's time for the body of Christ to stop being boring, to stop being easy to stop settling and to step out into the wild, wild waters where Jesus is. Isn't that what you want? I mean, honestly, at the end of the day, if we're honest, isn't that what we want? We want adventure. We want excitement. Wouldn't it be awesome if it was more exciting to be awake than dreaming? Yes. Wouldn't it be something if we could stop surviving from day to day and start thriving. What would it say to the world if the people of God were the most exciting, biggest risk takers, the most successful entrepreneurs, the best inventors, or whatever your dream is, simply because we got out of the boat and started walking on the water where Jesus is. The thing about Peter that I will always love is that Peter understood that it's better to be out of the boat with Jesus than to be in the boat without him. Yes. So here's some things that I believe will help us all step out of the boat and adventure well. So say this with me first. The Word of God, Word of God. is my catalyst, my catalyst. For, personal for personal reformation and total transformation. Total transformation. As, it my heart, As it invades my heart, it permeates my soul, permeates my soul. I carry revival, I carry revival. I release the kingdom, I release the kingdom. And, I walk in my and I walk in my identity as a child of God. Child of God. Amen. Amen. All right, number one, do what you need to do, but make room for what you want to do. Proverbs 22, 29 says, do you see a man skilled in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. Don't quit your job. To follow your dream. <laughs> Unless it's time. <laughs> but do your job with excellence. Yeah. And in the midst of that, make room for your passion. If all you're doing is settling for a job right. that doesn't make you happy but gets stuff done, you're going to miss out on everything that God has for you. Because in the midst of the mundane, we stop dreaming. So we have to make room for our passion to grow. And as you excel at the things that you're responsible for, for the things that might be considered mundane, as you make room for your passion and as your passion grows, I think we cannot be surprised when God starts sending strangers and strange encounters with people whose desire is to help you turn your passion into something much, much greater. Amen. Right. I'll never forget the day that I got a call out of the blue from Linda Everly. I had heard of the Everlys for a long time, but I would never met them. And we were doing youth ministry with these guys and got a message on Facebook, actually. And Linda said, hey, um, my husband Harold and I, we heard about what you're doing. We'd love to get together and just sit down and, and talk about what you're doing. I thought, well, that's cool. I've heard of Harold Everly. That's exciting. That's fun. And had no idea what I was getting into. And so we sat down with Harold and Linda and had breakfast with them one morning at Ballesteri's. 
and heard about their ministry, told them what we were doing. And, and you guys know Harold. If you know Harold, you know he loves to release whatever God's given him. And he said, Sean, I feel like it's time for you to start writing. He said, do you have a passion to write? I said, well, yeah, I'd love to, but I don't have the foggiest idea where to start. And he goes, well, I will help you because I feel like it's time right. for you to start putting your passion uh, to the page. Mm -hmm. And within a year, I had published my first book. So don't be surprised when you're doing what you're supposed to do well and making room for your passion when God starts sending people along who will help your passion become reality, make room for, for it. I'm convinced that much of our troubles come when we only cultivate necessity and give up on what brings about our passion. The second thing is this. Be supernaturally calculated, but not naturally reckless. Proverbs 21, verse 1, it says, My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. This is a big one because sometimes we prematurely jump off a cliff before God has given us the wings that he promised us. <laughs> If he promised you wings, trust that he's going to bring them. But don't go jumping off any cliffs if you don't got them yet. I've struggled with this. Tennille can tell you I've struggled with this. David Carroll can probably tell you I've, I've struggled with this. My tendency has been ready, fire, aim rather than ready, aim, fire. Um, so <laughs> but, but that's important. If God's telling you you're going to fly, then you can stand on that. But keep standing on that until he tells you to fly. Who's affected by your decisions? And do you have their support? Um, if not, then why not? Because if God puts people in your life that you trust, or if God puts your spouse in your life and you start flying and they're not ready to fly, that can be scary. So make sure that the people in your life are ready to go with you. And if you feel like they're just being held back because they don't get it and they don't understand the vision, then pray that God changes their heart. But don't move without the support of the people in your life that you trust. Because God has put them there for a reason. And sometimes the harsh reality is that we've brought a lack of trust from others upon ourselves by being untrustworthy at times. That stinks, but it's true. And so if people who are affected by your decisions don't trust you, find out why. And then work to solve that issue so that as you grow, you can take those risks with their full support. This next one is one of my favorites, and it's one that, that God has really just been having fun um, with me in, and that's that you write down your vision. If you got a vision, write it down. Put it on paper. Keep it in front of you so that you can see it. How many times, and, and I'm guilty of this, so we're just going to do this together, but how many times have you heard a word from the Lord and you didn't write it down, and you can't remember what that word was, and it was a good one? <laughs> I've been there. Anybody else been there? I love that we have a culture now where when anybody starts getting a word, people throw out their phones and they're ready to record that thing. That's brilliant. I love it. But I've not always done that. And I, I would be surprised if there – I wouldn't be surprised if people here have not always done that. But write down the vision. Make it clear. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 2, it says, Then the Lord replied, Write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation waits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. Love yes, this. Amen. It will certainly come and will not amen. delay. <laughs> we'll take that as an amen. All right. <laughs> I would challenge you to make a bucket list. Anybody ever made a bucket list? Who here has made a bucket list? Anybody? Okay, not enough people have made a bucket list. All right, so I want you to go home, or this week, I want you to make a bucket list. I'm telling you, this is powerful. We did this several years ago, and it's been amazing the things that have been checked off that might not have been ever checked off otherwise. Write the vision down. Make it plain. Make it clear. Um, one thing that we did back in 2013, in fact, Adam was sitting with me when we did this. We were sitting in Northtown Coffee before it moved to the train depot even, and we were talking about jumping into this thing. How are we going to go after the things that God has for us? And we were talking about John 14, 12 that says anyone who believes in me will do the things that I'm doing and greater things. 
And I said, well, man, well, what does that mean? And we started talking about all the things that Jesus did. And we thought, well, that means that we should be able to see in our lives every single miracle that Jesus did. We should be able to see that, too. Amen. So we thought, what if we took a year and we just marked out a year? To write down every single miracle that Jesus did and then watch for an opportunity to be able to experience those miracles in our lives going about and doing this ministry thing. And so we created what we call the Jesus bucket list. Wow. We're going to do this at some point. God has really just hit me with this. We're going to do this as a church at some point. We're going to create another Jesus bucket list. And then we're going to go throughout our year and we're going to mark off. Every time that we see God do something Amen. incredible. Amen. Because he said, these things will you do and greater. Right. So we can count on it. We can bank on it. And man, the stuff we saw was absolutely incredible. And the faith that it began to build was absolutely incredible. Am I right? I mean, it was like we just expected it. It's like we would come across people who had a need. Okay, what do you need? Cool, God's going to do it. And he would do it. We, um, I had one of our adult leaders come to me one night. And she said, Sean... I want to, I want God to use me to raise the dead. I said, awesome, that's cool. Let's pray about it. Let's pray into it. And so we started praying, Lord, give us an opportunity. Now that's a little bit of a scary prayer. When you start saying, Lord, give me an opportunity to raise the dead, it's like, well, who's he gonna kill? You know, I mean, who not? No. And so, but we uh, we did. We prayed that prayer. The very next day, she called me and she said, Sean, uh, my mom is in the hospital. Um, would you please, please pray? I'm going to be with her. And so I immediately thought, uh-oh, <laughs> you know, uh, we just prayed this prayer. But um, she was in the hospital. I went to see them. I prayed with them, spent time with them. And that night, um, after I had left, this, this leader stayed all throughout the night. And she called me the next day going crazy. She was just off. The, I couldn't even understand what she was saying. I said, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? She goes, Sean, do you remember I asked God to use me to raise the dead? And I said, yeah, 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 yeah. What, what's going on? What's going on? She said it was late in the middle of the night, and she said, I was just sitting there. I couldn't sleep. My mom was asleep, but the person in the next room died, wow. flatlined. Yes. And she said the doctors ran into the room and started freaking out. She said, Sean, I stepped into the hall, and I said, in Jesus' name. And as soon as I said, in Jesus' name, the doctors came out high-fiving, clapping, and cheering because the person had come back. Oh, Write the vision down, make it plain, yeah. so that he who hears it may run with it. Verbalize what you're asking for and write it down. I can tell you story after story. These guys can tell you story after story of what we saw God do as we wrote the vision down. The next thing is this. Ask what you can do. Ask what God can do. And then ask what can we do. We as in me and God and Jesus and Holy Spirit. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. Guys, I can't stop at what I'm capable of because what I'm capable of is offensive to God. Think about that for just a second. What I'm capable of is offensive. Why? Because I don't need him when I'm operating in my own power. I'm not intimidated by my own skill set. Doesn't scare me. Doesn't freak me out. Doesn't frighten me. I'm intimidated by dreams that I can't accomplish by those skills alone. So a great question to ask is how much do I actually need God in my life? How much of your life is spent completely and totally relying on Holy Spirit? Do you need Holy Spirit to help you get gas in your car? Do you need Holy Spirit to help you find the bacon? I don't, I know where it is. It's no problem. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> but what do you need Holy Spirit for? And if you can't think of that many things, it's time to start taking some risks. It's time to start saying, Holy Spirit, what do you want to do today? Get ready to be scared. Get ready to be excited. And I'll tell you what, there are people within this congregation that have been there and get it, and they'll go with you. Doug Byrne is an amazing guy that, that you can talk to about 
getting excited for going out and taking risks because this guy does it all the time. And there are others here as well who get it. But I can't stop at what God can do either because what God can do is obvious. He's God, okay? So what God can do is easy, but that's why Jesus became a man. And that's one of the biggest truths that I think has been released to me over the last few years is that when Jesus came, he came, yes, he came as God, but he lived as a man. The Bible says that Jesus is God and man, but he laid down his godness in order to live as a man. Now, don't get me wrong. He could have taken it back up again. I'm not saying that Jesus was not God, but he laid down that nature so that he could live as a man to show me what a man can do in right relationship with God. See, if, if Jesus did everything he did just as God, then I don't have any hope because I'm not God. I can't do what God does, but I can do what Jesus did if he lived as a man who shows me what a man in right relationship with the Father is capable of. Yeah. Does that make sense? Amen. I have to ask God, what can we do? What are we going to do today? Because God wants to provide the answer to that question. He's excited to tell you what you and God and Jesus and Holy Spirit can accomplish together. He's waiting for the sons and daughters to be revealed so that we can take this world by force and show them what heaven truly looks like. So we ask, what's my role? What's your role? And how do I trust you to put your super into my natural? <laughs> Next thing is this, welcome trouble. I don't like this one. <laughs> welcome trouble. Danny, do you know anything about that? <laughs> Because trouble has the potential to refine us. John chapter 16, verse 33 says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. Couldn't you have left that out, Jesus? No, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Jesus promised that in this life that we would have many troubles. It wasn't a warning, it was a call to adventure because Jesus overcame the world. So troubles are not something to avoid, they're something to embrace head on. Every trouble we face has the potential to catapult us closer to our destiny because Jesus is making all things work together for my good. If Jesus has truly overcome the world, then there is nothing that happens that cannot be turned for my good. If you've been waiting for a long time for things to get good and they're not good yet, ask why. Maybe you're stuck. And maybe because there's never a deficit on the promises of God. So if we're not getting it, it's not because God's being stubborn. Usually it's because we are. Okay, I don't like that one. We're going to move on. All right. <laughs> When one door closes, don't stop opening doors. Okay? The Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. The actual translation of this verse is keep asking, keep seeking, and keep knocking. Jesus wouldn't tell us to keep knocking on doors that are already open, which tells me that not every door that you bang on is going to budge. So don't stop opening doors. Don't stop knocking on doors. Sometimes your destiny requires really thick skin. Anybody been there? Anybody know what I'm talking about? That you would not be able to accomplish the destiny that God has for you without thick skin. So if you don't face some reje rejection, you could end up throwing your destiny completely away the moment that friction comes. We're so scared of reje rejection. Why is it that every kid nowadays gets a trophy? You can completely blow the game, and they're still going to give you a trophy. It's ridiculous. <laughs> because we're scared of rejection. The truth is that rejection builds character. It toughens our skin, and it causes us to push a little bit harder. And sometimes it's that extra push that causes us to hit the nail on the head and achieve what we've been fighting so hard. 
You realize there are a lot of people who are walking around with lukewarm water because they're scared to add a little more heat, which would cause the water to boil, which would create steam, and steam powers locomotives. Anybody? But we're scared of the heat. And so we keep walking around with lukewarm adventure, with lukewarm dreams, with lukewarm destinies, because we're scared of a little heat. I'll leave that one there. <laughs> Attack bitterness with every weapon in your arsenal. For the love of God, Attack bitterness with every weapon in your arsenal. James chapter 3, verse 14 says, But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. Maybe we don't like this one either. I don't know. <laughs> For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil Practice. Let me tell you this. When you start going after your dream, the enemy is going to point out every single person who is accomplishing your dream when you're still waiting for the dream to become reality. And you know what he's going to tell you? He's not going to say, wow, look, they accomplished it, so you accomplished it. He's going to say, wow, they accomplished it, which means you're a failure. And so all of a sudden, the people who you could be taking excitement from, who could be garnering energy from, who could getting advice, could be getting advice from and learning from, now they become the enemy because they're getting what you don't currently have. God is trying to grow you to a place where he can give you your dreams. And the moment that somebody else comes along that looks like they're doing what you wish you were, we begin to sacrifice our dream in order to let bitterness take root. Here, here's a good truth to declare. Let's just do this together. If anybody needs it, we'll do it together. Ready? Say this with me. No one can hinder my dreams but me. No one can hinder my dreams but me. If God is for me, God is for me. who can be against me? God is refining me. He's refining my dream and positioning me for success. So in Jesus' name, I renounce accusation. I renounce bitterness. And I renounce jealousy. I won't let any lie of the enemy isolate me and place my destiny on hold. Because my destiny is on the way. Amen. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 and 15, it says, Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. Finally, realize that you have a green light. That's it. Yeah. Stephen, would you come and play for me, brother? I think there are too many Christians who are waiting on a word from God when they already have it. It's important to knock on the right doors, but sometimes we're knocking on doors when God just wants us to stay and play outside. Maybe you don't need to go through that door because you've got a huge, wide open space and God has no desire to confine you within some door. Are you tired of praying prayers that God has already said yes to? <laughs> Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 and 19, it says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And then he tags on to the very end of that. But make sure whatever you do, wait until, you know, you've prayed about it a lot and heard from a whole bunch of people and got confirmation of this. Oh, wait, no, I don't think he did say that. No, that's not in there. No, he said, he said, go. 
2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 says, For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and of love and self-control. Psalm chapter 81, verse 10 says, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. Not stand there and ask me to fill your mouth. Just open your mouth. Ready? Everybody open? No, I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. Romans 8, 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 17 says, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Matthew 19, 26, Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And if you're still not quite sure, let me give you one more. It's in Acts chapter 16, verse 6. It says, Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, being forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia, they came up against Mycenae and were attempting to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mycenae, they came down to Troas. What in the world was that all about? I'll tell you what that was all about. The disciples did not sit around saying, Lord, where do you want us to go? They went. And when the Lord didn't want them to go someplace, he told them, so you have a green light. You can go. You have Holy Spirit. If you have Holy Spirit, he's a pretty good GPS. And if he doesn't want you to go someplace, you'll hear him saying in that terribly annoying voice, recalculating, recalculating, recalculating. <laughs> you better pay attention because if you watch The Office, you know you might end up in a lake. <laughs> Sorry to anybody who didn't get that. You get to go. You get to go. And he'll go with you. And if he doesn't want you to go, he'll stop you from going. Amen. See, Peter couldn't stay in the boat when he was looking at Jesus. He couldn't do it. You can't see Jesus. You can't look at Jesus walking on the water and not go. Okay, so what about the other disciples? Here's what I'm convinced of. I'm convinced they weren't looking at Jesus. They were looking at the storm. Because whenever we look at the storm, that tells us to stay wherever it is that we are currently safe and do whatever it is that we are currently capable of doing. But when we look at Jesus, all of a sudden the storm doesn't seem quite that important anymore. You see, the other disciples, their instinctual thought was, I can try and figure out what Jesus is doing, or I can row. And I'm going to row because it's within my power to do so. You feel like you're stuck rowing? You ever get to that place where it just feels like, man, I'm just, just rowing? What would happen if you stopped looking at the wind and the waves for just a moment and heard Jesus say, you want to walk on water? You want to come out here? You want to see what this is like? I guarantee you there is no way that you can walk on water in your own power. It's not going to happen. But there's no guarantee that the rowing you're doing is going to get you anywhere either. You might survive. You might make it through the month. You might make it through another month. But isn't there something about walking on water with Jesus that seems better? There's something about getting on the waves in the midst of a storm with Jesus. It sounds a little more exciting. I want you to stand with me this morning. Would you just close your eyes and we just put ourselves in a place of receiving for just a moment? ask him, what does this mean for me right now? <laughs> Why in the world are we talking about something as crazy as getting out of a boat and walking on water? Because that's where the adventure starts. Jesus, we're tired of rowing. 
We're tired of trusting in our own strength. We're tired of trusting in our own power, our own ability to keep the boat moving forward. Jesus, we're looking for adventure where we can get out to the place of knowing that our own skills and our own ability and our own power is not going to sustain us. Yes. But we're ready to step out onto the waves and trust that as we keep our eyes on you, you're going to take us places we could have never dreamt of on our own. So, Father, would you just release dreams right now? Would you just allow him to reawaken within you maybe some old dreams that you've allowed to die? You thought they were never possible. You thought they could never happen. And I'm talking about any dream that has been within your heart. In the kingdom of God, we're doing this thing without any dividing lines between secular and sacred. When you stepped into the kingdom, it all became sacred. So your work is sacred. Your family is sacred. Your friendships are sacred. Your driving down the road to go to the store is sacred. And the dreams that you thought, oh, those are just, those are silly. God could never care about that. They're sacred. Your dreams of going back to school and doing another year of Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry is pretty sacred. Your dreams of seeing the homeless issue in Yakima resolve is sacred. Your dream of starting a company that furthers the kingdom of God is sacred. Your dreams of writing that book are sacred. Your dreams of impacting the world through your creativity is sacred. Everything that God has placed in your heart, he's put there for a reason. And maybe there are new dreams that are coming to life right now, that are sparking right now. Let him begin to work those things within you. I'm amazed. Just a couple weeks ago when we were talking about creativity within this room, I was amazed at how many people came up and said, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready to do it. I'm ready to release this. I'm ready to go after this. I'm ready to do this. So guys, I think this is what God is speaking to us right now. Is getting out of the boat, stepping out onto the water, and adventuring with Jesus. I promise you, all things are possible. Amen. All things are possible. So what is possible? Father, I thank you this morning that you are lighting up our heart with new dreams, new vision, and old dreams that we thought we had to give up on old dreams that we thought we had to let go and old dreams we thought we had to let die. You are sparking, you are reigniting those dreams and you are bringing them back to the forefront so that we could begin asking what is possible. So I pray that in the coming week and in the coming month and in the coming months and in the coming year, Father, that we would see dreams birthed out of Dad's house that change the world, that in this little town called Yakima, that we would see a ministry so powerful, so vibrant with people who have come alive to their place in the kingdom as sons and daughters of God who are meant to transform this world, not escape to another one, but to transform this world, that we would see your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven in a way like the world has never seen before because you have called us to dream you've called us to boldly go where many have never gone before for the name of your son Jesus Christ we love you this morning Father we thank you for what you're doing and what you have yet to do we bless you and we thank you in Jesus name Thanks for watching this message from Dad's House Church in Yakima, Washington. Be sure to check out dadshousechurch.org for other videos and more exciting information.